of uh, Montesinos, uh, the, I think will be in Italian or Italian English. I don't know. Anyway, the, since it will be so, uh, the number of people is already low. Some already left. I read. So here, I would like to thank uh, to thank uh, uh, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science for for the support to the organization of this conference, the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem with uh, the th three um, institutions that supported uh, this conference. And also uh, I would like to, to address a special thank to the technical assistance of ICTP that uh, was offered on, on the basis of an agreement that we have with ICTP and uh, Mila, Claudia, Lina, who did a fantastic uh, uh, work and they deserve another applause and all, to, all together also for the assistance. And uh, also some uh, extra funds that arrived to Fundazione Casali and other extra funding for, for this activity, which is not the usual one for, for CISA. Uh, and uh, so I leave the floor to Montesino while we'll, uh, we search for the chairman of the set of the afternoon. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I will read uh, my text in Italian, only two pages, only 10 minutes. Uh, lo farò in italiano perché la lingua nella quale sempre ho parlato con Jürgen. Caro Jürgen, Cuando 20 años fa, sei venuto a Tenerife per partecipare al convenio Galileo 2001, organizzato dalla Fundación Canaria por Otava de Historia de la Ciencia. Appena ti ho conosciuto, ho capito che saresti stato un personaggio chiave per lo sviluppo di quella allora ancora giovane istituzione. In quel tempo eri già direttore dell'Istituto Max Planck per la storia della scienza di Berlino e il fatto che valutasti molto positivamente il lavoro che stavamo facendo noi insegnanti di scuola secondaria, amanti della storia delle idee e della storia della scienza, fu di grande aiuto per noi e per le autorità politiche delle isole Canarie che ci finanziavano. Così, dopo il brillante svolgimento del convegno più importante sulla figura e l'opera di Galileo che si abbia fatto, un giorno, invitati da te, ci presentammo a Berlino insieme con il sindaco della Orotava, Isaac Valencia, e con il consigliere d'educazione del governo delle Canarie, José Miguel Ruano León, fosti allora uno splendido anfitrione e ci mostrasti l'istituzione da te diretta e molte fra le cose più belle della splendida città di Berlino. In quella occasione abbiamo sigillato un'amicizia che si è mantenuta fino ad oggi. L'anno successivo Abbiamo organizzato a Puerto de la Cruz un incontro internazionale sulla figura di Archimede, al quale pure prendisti parte. Fosti allora invitato a pronunciare il pregon alle fiesta della Orotava, un onore che solo raramente viene concesso a un non canario. Jürgen Ren era già uno dei nostri. Nell'estate del 2002, facemmo un altro convegno internazionale a Maspalomas, nell'isola di Gran Canaria, e il tema del quale era scienza e romanticismo. Tu ed io presentammo insieme una relazione, le spedizioni scientifiche nelle isole Canarie nel periodo romantico. E in quella occasione ci proponemmo di organizzare un grande convegno sull'opera e la figura di Einstein, delle quali sei un eccezionale investigatore. Per commemorare nel 2005 il centenario della teoria della relatività ristretta, al quale parteciparono, come nel caso del congresso Galileo, 
y máximi especialisti mondiale del argumento. Nel aprile del 2006 fummo insieme a Città del Messico, invitati dalla prestigiosa Università Nazionale Autonoma de México e dal suo Museo della Scienza, dove, dove abbiamo tenuto conferenze e gettato le basi della fruttifera collaborazione che ha prodotto i convegni intitolati Scienza e Cultura entre dos mundos, Knowledge in Transit, tenutisi nell'isola della Gomera, nello Stato messicano di Puebla e nella stessa Berlino. Lascio il posto ora a una interpretazione di una parte del tuo percorso intellettuale, della evoluzione del tuo pensiero nell'ambito della storia della scienza, che ha scritto il mio collega Sergio Toledo Prats, che mi è succeduto nel ruolo di direttore della Fondazione Canaria Orotava di Storia della Scienza. Toledo Plas era un insegnante di filosofia. Parole per Jürgen. Desideriamo ringraziare Jürgen Rehm per aver dimostrato di essere un degno rappresentante di quella tradizione filosofica che da Socrate a Habermas ha considerato la ricerca della verità come un'attività di dialogo, così come abbiamo avuto occasione di verificare nel corso dei progetti di collaborazione tra la sua equip di lavoro e la nostra fondazione di storia della scienza. La connessione fra di noi è stata immediata perché condividiamo la sua visione della conoscenza fondata su un radicato senso storico come processo evolutivo nel quale non si può dissociare il teorico dal pratico, né lo scientifico dal tecnico. Il suo interesse per la globalizzazione della conoscenza è il miglior testimone del suo cosmopolitismo intellettuale. Questo interesse ha volato dal paese dei Sumeri sulle sonore alli della nascente scrittura decifrando i labirinti dei segni che quelle arcaiche civiltà disseminavano verso Oriente e Occidente. Hai cavalgato con la scienza greca a dorso di un camello batriano da Alessandria fino a Damasco e Baghdad per osservare il mutare di questa all'interno del sapere islamico e ha seguito il suo viaggio di ritorno nell'Europa medievale attraverso Costantinopoli e Salerno, Cordova e Toledo. Si è imbarcato sui galeoni spagnoli per verificare i risultati della civiltà preispaniche mesoamericane e andine. Ha accompagnato le assolute certezze cosmologiche di Galileo e Newton nel loro cammino fino al tempo relativo di Einstein e alla incertezza quantica di Heisenberg. La sua epistemologia storica è erede di tutti questi viaggi nello spazio e nel tempo, attraverso i quali è rimasto attento alle strette relazioni tra lo sviluppo della cultura tecnica materiale, i sistemi economici e i saperi teorici. Per dirla in altro modo, Scusatemi. Per dirla in altro modo, ha riflettuto sulla relazione tra l'utilità dei manufatti pratici, la soddisfazione delle necessità produttive e la trasmissione del sapere condiviso. Siamo convinti che l'apprendimento di Jürgen in merito agli gli incontri fra culture, fra sistemi distinti di conoscenza, abbia avuto una influenza importante sulla sua concessione degli oggettivo, oggettivi e delle priorità di una politica scientifica adeguata al nostro tempo. La sua prospettiva ci mostra un processo emergente di evoluzione epistemica dovuto al fatto che che la produzione e la trasmissione della conoscenza si è convertita 
en un fenómeno esencial para la sopravivencia de la nuestra especie. Y la comunidad científica ha aunque el deber de responder a la demanda de adorno que ciencia podamos hacer después de Auschwitz, Jürgen ha indicado que cuestiones escotantes como el cambiamiento climático, el renovo de las fuentes de energía o las malattie epidémicas dovute a cambiamientos socioculturales no pueden ser lasciate semplicemente en las manos de los mercados o de las instituciones políticas. Pero la comunidad científica es tenuta a svolger una función muy activa en el tratamiento de estos problemas y en las relativas propuestas de resolución a largo término. Como histórico, Jürgen es consciente del aparente paradoxo fondato sul fatto que più conosciamo el mundo, più eso diventa complejo. Una nota lección de Karl Popper enseña que no podemos saber ahora lo que sabremos en futuro de aquello que ahora ignoramos. L'indole optimista de Jürgen lo porta a creer que la ignorancia agrava i nostri mali molto più de la sapienza. Da qui la difesa de una nueva dinámica epistémica que comprende la globalización de las redes del saber y el libero acceso a través de Internet a la información académica con la esperanza de acrecer la utilidad universal de las invenciones científicas. Si ha lasciato mucho indietro la vecchia imagen de la ciencia como un saber puro, absoluto, eterno y desinteresado, una visión que transformaba la historia de la ciencia en una teología ingenua del nuevo saber omnipotente que aspiraba a la hegemonía ideológica. En este senso, volvemos a evidenciar en Jürgen la apertura al diálogo con otros lenguajes que forman una parte vital de la evolución humana, como la religión, el arte, la literatura, la filosofía y el derecho. Esta multiplicidad de intereses constituye un valor muy positivo, especialmente si consideramos la tendencia a la especialización en ámbitos muy ridotti de la conocencia que prevale hoy en ogni campo del saber, un male per la cultura e la civiltà che già un secolo fa il nostro pensatore spagnolo Ortega y Gasset denunciò e che si può superare solo attraverso un deciso impegno in favore dei saperi interdisciplinari. Per finire, in questi tempi in cui incombono su di noi i vecchi fantasmi dell'autoritarismo e del populismo antiliberale, Desidero hacer un elogio de las profundas convicciones democráticas de Jürgen, no solo por cuanto atiene a la promoción de la democracia interna en las instituciones científicas, sino también en el approccio a las condiciones en que se ejercita la ciencia en una sociedad democrática, que necesita de avanzar verso una un mayor participación de los ciudadanos a las grandes cuestiones de la política científica. Solo así, ciencia y democracia podrán reforzarse a vicenda y en este camino sabemos de poder contar su Jürgen Ren. Caro Jürgen, siempre a tu disposición. Aspeta. Aspeta.
Thanks, everybody. I'm Carsten Reinhardt, uh, the step in for the chair of the session, and we'll start with a talk by Ursula Klein, research scholar at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, professor at the University of Constance, an expert in early modern history of chemistry, and also now uh, talking about the earth system sciences in political context. Please, Ursula, yours. Yes, here, this one. Okay, and I have to push this button, right? Uh, yes, you can go to the arrows. Yeah. Or you can use yeah, I use this. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. We will make a big jump in history in this afternoon session from the early modern period to the most recent period to the 20th century and the 21st century. And my talk will be concerned with earth system science in the late 20th century and the 21st century. Dear Jürgen, dear colleagues and friends, earth system science provides the major scientific background in the current debates about the Anthropocene. As you may know, earth system scientists aim to study the earth as a single integrated system. They wish to build a unified understanding of the earth. Humans have been thinking about the Earth as an integrated whole for millennia, millennia. In religion, ancient philosophy, early modern cosmology, 18th century geography, 19th century geology, and so on. In a recent paper by leading Earth system scientists on the history of their science, the authors even claim that Earth system science shares some basic beliefs with old folk wisdom. For tens of thousands of years, they state, indigenous cultures around the world have recognized cycles and systems in the environment and that humans are an integral part of this. So what is new about earth system science? The scientists I just quoted provide the following answer. It was only in the 20th century that contemporary systems thinking was applied to the earth, initiating the emergence of earth system science. We will see in a minute what systems thinking means in the framework of studies of the earth. But systems thinking did not originate in this context. On the contrary, it was a fashionable approach in the post-World War II sciences which was indeed applied from outside, so to speak, to the earth sciences. In addition, I will also show that in this new context, systems thinking underwent significant changes. In the 1980s, earth system science was established as a new approach in the earth sciences through a number of initiatives on national levels, mainly in the US, and by founding new international scientific organizations, such as the World Climate Research Program and the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. In the following four decades, Earth system science was subject to changes on many levels, with respect to its institutional organization, political activities, cooperation among scientists and scholars, approaches and methods, concepts and understanding. In my talk, I will concentrate on the latter issue, conceptual changes. I will ask how did earth system scientists understanding of the global earth system changed in the last four decades? Scientists' overall understanding of the Earth is not only of historical and epistemological interest, it is also what counts in the, current, in the current public and political debates about the Anthropocene. As you may know, a number of Anthropocene activists have questioned that recent science has added anything new to the debate. I will show you that this is wrong. 
Since the 1980s, there have been profound changes of scientists' understanding of the Earth system. One of these concerns the role played by humankind and the technosphere in the Earth system. This aspect of contemporary Earth system science I will not discuss, and I guess that Ricarda and Manfred will take up this issue. The other concerns the functioning and dynamics of the natural Earth system, and this is the focus of my talk. Allow me a brief remark on methods. Contemporary Earth system scientists distinguish three methods of knowledge production. Observation and experiments, modeling the Earth system, assessments and synthesis. It is the latter approach that interests me. Assessments and synthesis are presented in relatively non-technical texts, written in ordinary language, mostly English, and typically illustrated by so-called conceptual models, that is block diagrams and pictures. While Earth system scientists' empirical research and modeling is a black box for most Anthropocene activists and policymakers, the publications presented in assessments and synthesis are accessible to a broader, even if intellectual, audience. It should be noted that it is mainly through the writing and discussing of such kinds of texts that Earth system scientists reflect about and articulate their overall understanding of the Earth system. There's no other place they are doing this. And I would like to add the following, as assessments address policymakers and include normative assumptions related to politics, these kinds of publications are always mixed political scientific publications. Now I come to the main part of my talk and begin with the predominant understanding of the Earth system in the 1980s, at the time when they became institutionalized. A major step toward the institutional organization of Earth system science in the 1980s was the preparatory work carried out in the US by the Earth System Sciences Committee founded by NASA and the National Science Foundation. In a report from 1986, which is now famous for its Bretherton diagram of the Earth system, the committee members describe Earth system science as a natural science and as a basic science. They clearly separate basic research from its practical and political applications. By the way, this is a difference from today's Earth system science that I will not discuss in more detail. What is of interest for us is the fact that with, with respect to application, optimistic overtones clearly prevailed in the 1980s. And I quote now from the report, the pursuit of an improved quality of life upon the earth, improved quality of life upon the earth, goes hand in hand with the search for greater scientific understanding of the earth itself. The application of basic science to human needs is today proceeding more vigorously than ever before. Earth system scientists' political optimism resonated with contemporary systems thinking in other fields, such as civil and military engineering, which aimed at controlling, managing, and optimizing large-scale technical infrastructures and complex activities. It also went hand in hand with scientists' overall understanding of the Earth system. The committee members define Earth system science as follows. The goal of Earth system science is to obtain a scientific understanding of the entire Earth system on a global scale by describing how its component parts and their interactions have evolved over the Earth's history, how they function, and how they may be expected to continue to evolve on all timescales. And the challenge to Earth system science is to develop the capability 
to predict those changes that will occur in the next decades to century, both naturally and res to, in response to human activity. What is expressed in the first quotation is an engineer's understanding of a system. The Earth system is defined as an object consisting of parts which interact and have certain functions with respect to the whole thing. Almost the same, almost the same, could be said about a railroad system or a system of defense missiles. A railroad system is more than its parts through its overall function and its purpose. However, the Earth system does not have a purpose. Does it have a function? And what kind of emergent processes and phenomena shall be explored? That is, processes that do not exist on the level of the parts. In their report, the committee members do not ask these kinds of questions. Of course, the Earth scientists were well aware that there is an important difference between a technical system and the Earth system. The Earth system undergoes changes in history. The language chosen in the report suggests that the Earth system evolves slowly and gradually during large parts of its history, rather than undergoing abrupt revolutionary changes. In other words, change does not seriously affect the stability of the Earth system. Hence, the committee members highlight the limits of variability in the Earth's history. I quote again, the reality of global change stimulates us to understand its causes and, and to determine the limits of variability that arise through interactions among the components of the Earth system. So all in all, the committee members were optimistic that empirical knowledge about the past and insight into the functioning of the Earth system would enable them to predict the Earth's future and perhaps even to control it. The view that the Earth system is a relatively stable system and undergoes only slow, gradual changes during most of its history is even more clearly articulated in another US program, which approached the Earth from the perspective, not of uh, Earth sciences, but of systems ecology. In the late 1970s, National Science Foundation and NASA co-founded a committee on planetary biology which developed a so-called program for a global ecology or a science of the biosphere. In the committee's report from 1986, the same year as the other report, stability of natural ecosystems is highlighted. And I quote again from this report. The continuing stability of certain ecological systems is critical for the survival of human beings. Since we have no adequate understanding of what leads to stability of natural systems, research is needed to collect the relevant data which a from which a theory of the stability of ecosystems can be derived. The other quotes like the persistence of time of ecosystem functions implies some kind of stability, but the factors determining stability are not known, and so on. Now, the interesting question is, of course, can this view of local ecosystems be extended? of local ecosystems be extended to the scale of global knowledge of the global biosphere or the surface earth system. It is only in passing that the systems ecologists state, I quote, since over geological times, the constraints change and the global ecological system moves to new states 
the biosphere seems to be a less stable system than the local system. In contrast to this pers perspective forced on us by a global point of view, ecological theory has assumed that the biotic systems at local scales are stable entities that resist or react to changes in a relatively constant environment. Thus, attention has focused on controls that permits the system to return to its initial state following per perturbation. So, based on their empirical knowledge about the history of the Earth, the biosphere scientists concede that the assumption of a stable biosphere or a surface Earth system is problematic. However, their empirical knowledge did not yet propel them to seriously question the received theoretical understanding of the Earth as a relatively stable system, which undergoes gradual linear change over most parts of its history. Forty years later, all of this had changed. And I now come to the later period, to the 2020s. In a recent paper, Jürgen summarizes elegantly the new understanding of the Earth system in contemporary Earth system science. The Anthropocene as a concept is also the result of a new kind of Earth science, a transition from geology to Earth system science, whereby our planet can be understood as a nonlinear complex system with many feedback loops. According to this new understanding, the Earth system is not only subject to uniform change processes, but can also achieve tipping points that lead to such catastrophic changes as snowball Earth events which have happened several times in the past. This is why some also speak of a new catastrophism. Let me give you a few illustrations of this new understanding of the Earth system as an utterly, utterly vulnerable system that can be pushed over certain thresholds beyond which irreversible disruptive changes may occur. Very briefly, what are tipping points and tipping elements? The term tipping point is a metaphor, of course, that is used very broadly, not only in scientific contexts. It means, commonly means, a critical threshold at which a small perturbation can qualitatively alter the state of an object or of a system. In Earth system science, tipping points were first recognized in certain regions of the Earth, such as the Amazon rainforest and the Greenland ice sheets. These regions are called tipping elements. They are particularly vulnerable elements of the entire system because of their internal dynamics of change. While tipping elements are still confined to the regional scale of the Earth, the newer concept of tipping cascades refers to the planetary scale and to changes of the whole Earth system. I quote again a leading group of Earth system scientists. More recent research has focused on the causal coupling between tipping elements and their potential to form cascades. Tipping cascades could provide the dynamical process that drives the transition of the Earth system from one state to another, effectively becoming a planetary level threshold. The scientists add that research on tipping elements and cascades highlights the ultimate risk of destabilization of the Earth system as a whole. If the Earth system as a whole is de destabilized, it does not crash like a house in an earthquake. 
it rather shifts abruptly to a qualitatively different state. What kind of state could that be? And I quote again from another source. Our analysis suggests that the Earth system may be approaching a planetary threshold that could lock in a continuing rapid pathway toward a much toward much hotter conditions, to a hothouse Earth. This pathway would be propelled by strong intrinsic feedbacks, difficult to influence by human actions, a pathway that could not be reversed, steered, or substantially slowed. Now, a hothouse Earth is not just a few degrees hotter than today, it is much hotter. The scientists do not state clearly how much hotter, but what they clearly state is that hothouse Earth means not merely that our economy and social life is disrupted, rather the habitability of the planet for humans is at risk. That is human life, biological life is threatened. Clearly, present Earth scientists' understanding of the Earth system is significantly, significantly less optimistic than in the 1980s. But is it catastrophism? I think the term catastrophism is misleading for the following reasons. Given geologists' traditional use of the term catastrophe in the context of the history of geology, catastrophism has almost inevitably the connotation of being caused by external feedback, by external agents. Think of the great deluge, it's not only an external agents, but even a supernatural agent, or think of collisions with asteroids. By contrast, scientists now assume that the dynamics of the Earth system is characterized by strong intrinsic feedbacks. This is what I just quoted. Contemporary Earth system scientists tell us that the natural Earth system has the inherent potential to become unstable and shift abruptly to another state. Further, the dynamics of change in the Earth system is no longer described in terms of slow, gradual evolution. I quote again. Earth system dynamic can be described, studied, and understood in terms of trajectories between alternate states separated by thresholds, that are the tipping points, that are controlled by nonlinear processes, interactions, and feedbacks. In historiography, abrupt nonlinear change that leads to a qualitatively new state of a system is also called a revolutionary change. And in fact, some Earth system scientists have also used the term revolution for these kinds of changes. Now, let me briefly address the question of why the Earth system may become unstable, very briefly. Scientists' main answer to this question is today, there are both positive and negative feedback mechanisms in the Earth system. As you may know, the term feedback mechanism comes from, comes from cybernetics. Cybernetics highlights negative feedback mechanisms that correct perturbations and thus regulate the stable functioning of a machine or any other system. However, the Earth system is not regulated throughout by negative feedback mechanism. Today, Earth system scientists agree that the Earth system does not function like a cybernetic machine as theories of the 1918 proposed, such as Lovelock's famous cybernetic Earth system theory, also known under the name Gaia theory, which obscures the fact that it is a cybernetic theory. Further, the Earth feedback mechanism do not exist once and forever. If a part of a feedback mechanism changes, the entire feedback mechanism may be weakened or even disrupted. In other words, 
the Earth feedback mechanisms do not have the universality of natural laws. I come to my conclusion. In the 1980s, the majority of scientists believed that the Earth system is stable and evolved slowly and gradually during most of its history. They also believed that the few unstable periods in the Earth's history were caused by external forces. Today, Earth system scientists highlight the inherent potential of the Earth to become unstable, as well as abrupt and nonlinear or revolutionary change of the Earth system. Hence, the issue of stability or resilience of the Earth is now at the forefront of research, and I give you a quote for this. Earth system science now faces two critical research challenges. First, how stable and resilient is the Earth system? And the next, uh, how can we better understand the dynamics of human sciences? Given the fact that the new understanding of the Earth system as a potentially unstable system is linked to the physical concept of unstable systems, I conclude with a final quote by the physical chemist Ilya Prigozhin. Classical science emphasized order and stability. Now, in contrast, we see fluctuations, instability, and multiple choices, multiple choices, and limited predictability at all levels of observation. In the classical view, and here we include quantum mechanics and relativity, laws of nature express certitudes. When appropriate initial conditions are given, we can predict with certainty the future or retrodict the past. Once instability is included, this is no longer the case, and the meaning of the laws of nature changes radically, for they now express just possibilities or probabilities. We are observing the birth of a science that is no longer limited to idealized and simplified situations, but reflects the complexity of the real world. And I think this applies very well to earth system science as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ursula, for this great talk and also the time discipline. We have time for one or two short questions, Stefano. Uh, honestly, I, uh, Ursula, I, I did not know the, the NASA report, uh, but I'm really astonished. So I must well, say that uh, uh, I, 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 I am really astonished, especially sentences like uh, the every scientist knew that the Earth system is stable. I mean, that totally contradict what was my feeling in the 80s, what was the status of the stability of nonlinear systems. At was already clear to many of us that uh, since the work in the 50s, already of the people working in cybernetics that realized that uh, there are instabilities. And uh, so um, I don't really know who were these scientists. They yeah. were totally out of track. Uh, uh, they should have been fired for writing this <laughs> type of report. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm really astonished. So I want to, to say it very clearly because uh, I, I, I don't really understand what was going yeah. on in that, in that commission. You are absolutely right uh, as far as physics is concerned. And I would add even in, even in climate research, this was no longer the state of knowledge, but it is different concerning scientists studying the earth. And these were oceanographers, geologists, uh, uh, geophysicists, uh, geochemists, and so on. So this, were, this was a group of people headed by Francis Bretherton. And you saw simultaneously uh, other groups worked on this from a completely different perspective, from the ecosystem perspective. And here, uh, stability is even more, um, more uh, yeah, highlighted, yeah? This is, of course, I mean, in, in, Absolutely right. In other kinds of science, is not homogeneous. So, yeah. Thank you. We'll have time at the end of the session to discuss also these topics. So please hold your breath.
Um, thanks again, Ursula. Yep. So the next talk is by two presenters, Ricarda Winkelmann of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Research and also professor at the University of Potsdam, a mathematician and climate researcher, and by uh, Manfred Laubechler, Arizona State and the Santa Fe Institute. So, welcome. Okay, uh, so now for something completely different. First of all, uh, there are two presenters. Uh, there will be nonlinear effects in the presentation uh, leading to surprising results and potential catastrophes and instabilities, something that our science has knew for quite some time. Uh, what we will present is basically a version of evolutionary Earth system science. So an evolution and earth system science that takes change in all forms, gradual and this, as well as uh, discontinuous change very seriously. And it's also intended as a brief introduction into what the scientific program of the new Institute for Geoanthropology uh, should be. But before we get into this, uh, we have to also loosen up uh, th those proceedings. It's after all sort of you're celebrating Jürgen and the whole proceeding was way too serious. So uh, let me sort of give Jürgen an award for the Max Planck Society. And that is the Don Quixote Award because some of us have intrinsic knowledge about how long it took to get this new institute off the ground. It's after all an institute devoted to saving the planet uh, but that does not agree with the timescales of the Max Planck Society. And it only exists because Jürgen has the same quality as the man from La Mancha. So Jürgen, we have to make a, a medal for you as the Don Quixote medal in, within the Max Planck Society. Uh, because without that, we wouldn't have that institute. Okay, you have this control here. Okay. Now, yeah. And we want to start by just by reminding ourselves um, what a unique moment in Earth's history we're actually at at the moment. And the starts here and today. Um, so we're currently in midst of yet another heat wave um, in Europe and actually in other places of the world as well. And this is not a coincidence. There are more and more extreme events, um, heat waves such as this one, droughts, floods, um, storms, hurricanes, and so on. Um, all over the world, and they are becoming more frequent, they're also becoming more persistent and more severe. And this is really something that all of us have noticed. I mean, think back just two weeks when at the Mamolata here in Italy, uh, there was the glacier break, um, and that was likely caused by extreme heat. It's no coincidence that the hottest years ever recorded all include uh, the past years. So this is basically the past 10 years uh, with one exception, 2010, but all of the hottest years ever recorded um, are within this century. And how unique this is, I think in order to understand that, we actually have to dive back a little bit. So here you see the global mean temperature trajectory from the last ice age, roughly 20,000 years ago to today. And there are two things that I find really striking here. First of all, for thousands of years, the global mean temperature has been incredibly stable, except for that last hockey stick bit um, that we're in right now in the Anthropocene. And the second thing is the difference between an ice edge, such as this one 20,000 years ago, and an interglacial that we're currently in, that's roughly three to four degrees of temperature change. And what we're facing at the moment is the same or even more warming, uh, but in, first of all, in the other direction, but also at a much, much faster pace. So what happened in thousands of years in the past could potentially happen within decades or, or centuries. And clearly there are some of these future um, temperature scenarios where adaptation will simply become impossible. 
already today, there are people um, in the world who really cannot withstand temperatures, but there is a wet bulb temperature threshold where we humans really suffer immediately in terms of, of health and there could even be death caused by heat. Um, in addition to all the other changes that are occurring. So there really is a threshold there also for our physique. Now, along with these changes in the biogeophysical earth system, um, there are also many other changes in the socio-technical um, system. And here you see these trends put together. This is the famous great acceleration curve or, or great acceleration curves. And you really see, um, first of all, that we are dealing with a completely integrated and coupled system. Um, and that we see these kinds of trends, this post 50 dramatic increase in all kinds of um, variables, um, both in the socioeconomic and uh, socio-technic uh, terms, but also in earth system trends. So that gets us to where we are, and that is uh, the challenge and also the challenge uh, for the new Institute. So uh, what's clear that we have entered the Anthropocene, as you have seen uh, in that diagram of uh, Stefan's curves, uh, but the Anthropocene didn't just happen over the last 200 years or so. Of course, that state has been in the making for quite some time and it is the consequence of some complex and very long coevolutionary dynamics. Uh, as part of those dynamics uh, and again, not just over the last 200 years, uh, we are shaping and engineering our planet at unprecedented scales uh, to the fact, as Ricardo pointed out, that uh, basically humankind is no longer operating in a safe space. So the slightest hurricane, the slightest major event, the slightest fluctuation, which normally happens in all those systems can really put us over the edge. Uh, we also have seen, and again, everybody knows that, that new global challenges and systemic risks emerge rapidly. What that leads us, again, justification for the Institute, that we need a new scientific understanding uh, to meet these challenges. As Ursula has pointed out, when Earth system science, from some perspective, moves very glacially, like the Max Planck Society, and so we basically need to speed things up here rather dramatically. And that's basically geoanthropology. And uh, you, many of you have seen the diagram here. And uh, the foundation for that institute is what we call evolutionary earth system science. Yeah, and that requires us to really take on this long durée and also the systemic perspective that was pointed at um, earlier. So we really need to understand these human earth system interactions in a co-evolutionary sense. Um, and Two key phenomena of that, of course, are the great acceleration and also the emergence of the technosphere. And in order to understand those, we need to understand, first of all, growth and collapse dynamics. We need to understand instabilities and also stability um, in the human earth system, what that actually means. Um, and of course, in, if we are facing instabilities, then um, we need to understand um, critical intervention points and also possibilities for repair or recovery. Okay, so let's sort of get some theory uh, uh, out on the table here. And I agree with Stefano that those guys who wrote that report, uh, they should have been fired uh, or put in front of a firing squad or whatever appropriate measure you might think about this because that had nothing to do with what the state of understanding in the 1980s uh, about those processes really was. But we have to go even further back. If you talk about evolutionary earth system science, we have to have at least a cursory understanding of what we are talking about as evolutionary history. And uh, the deep history of evolved complexity is not one of gradual change, it has gradual change in it, but the really interesting parts that matter for the understanding of our current situation are the major transitions. And they are the ones like origin of life, origin of cellular life, multicellularity, and so on. And st studying those things, when evolution is actually interesting, uh, we see that those transitions show certain patterns. Every major uh, transition uh, involves a rewiring of the organization of the system, that includes social organization. It includes a rewiring and different use of the energy system, 
of that transition. Uh, and most importantly for our interest here, it also includes new forms of knowledge and information flows through that system and correspondingly also material flows. So those are system level descriptions that apply to all major transitions in the course of the last 3.8 billion years. What emerges based on that is that you get, once you have a major transition, the older systems don't go away. So we have multicellular life, but we have cells. You know, those transitions, you have then multiple layers of major transitions. And that emer uh, allows for emerging layers of complexity as well as feedback loops between those different layers of the system that we need to understand because they are a major part of the dynamics. And now for the Anthropocene and the technosphere in particular, it is clearly one of those major transitions in evolution. So that is the framework that we need to apply to understand the technosphere. Um, and there we get to something that sort of Ursula brought about because she was mo mostly talking about what I call the physics-based models of Earth systems dynamics, which are completely different from uh, co-evolutionary models of Earth systems dynamics that also existed at that time. Because if you have a co-evolutionary model, you have nonlinear nonlinearity right in the model. You also have one additional uh, very nasty feature that uh, that's why mathematicians, sorry, you try to avoid this um, because it's not just that the system changes, it's also that the dimensionality of the state space of the system changes. So we have changes upon changes that we need to understand. Uh, those uh, transformations that uh, account for major transitions, but also for coevolutionary dynamics more generally, involve an interplay between regulatory structures and niche construction. That's sort of the model that, uh, that Jürgen and myself and a few others are pushing in the context of transforming evolutionary theory. Uh, what does that give us if, orga if the system constructs its niche? but is in turn influenced by the niche, you can already see the possibility of feedback between the constructed or externalized niche and the intrinsic behavior of the system. And those are the kind of uh, feedback structures that we really need to understand. That involves clearly novel theory and modeling, and it leads to a new scientific understanding of the dynamic of the human earth system. Of course, we can claim this because we're starting an institute and all of that, so we have to claim it, but it actually happens to be true. Um, and why is this important? Because as we will see, Ricardo will talk about that in a moment, uh, one part of what we really need to do is not just be fatalistic about, uh, okay, nothing we can do, we are doomed anyway, or so, as an Austrian, that's a you know, legitimate way of life, uh, but, uh, and therefore nothing is really serious. Uh, but uh, if you want to intervene in order to shape global futures, we of course need to understand those various dynamics in order to identify possible intervention points. That's sort of an image, uh, thanks to Ricarda, uh, our artist here, um, of what actually happened. So you have now a new sphere, the technosphere, and it's not just a new sphere that lies there. It interacts with every other sphere on different time scales, and both on energy, material flows, and changing the time scale of operations of all the other spheres of the Earth system, it has dramatic consequences. So right now, it's basically pointless to study any of the other spheres without connecting it to the technosphere. Oh, one more. Uh, this is basically, we can go to that very quickly. This is a visual representation of what that extended evolutionary theory model uh, is all about. And uh, what it is about, I would be too stupid to figure out how the pointer works, but so the interesting things are those two dynamics, the internalization dynamics, the, uh, the feedback fl flow back from the constructed niche into the regulatory structures of the system, um, as well as how the constructed niche reshapes what selection pressures actually mean and fitness landscapes mean, uh, as well as how the phenotype or the system state influences its niche. So this is just that there is a visual representation to otherwise abstract ideas. 
Yeah, so how did we actually get here? Um, what brought about um, these ever-changing and also uh, am amplifying and accelerating um, feedbacks? And what brought about uh, the, the notion that we as humans are now rivaling the great forces of nature? This is, by the way, a picture um, from the German icebreaker Polar Stern facing <laughs> one of uh, the major icebergs. Um, that we see drifting um, through the Southern Ocean at the moment. So I would argue that part of this, um, of our history also as humans on Earth, is really that we had a narrow escape, um, and that is a narrow escape from a new ice age. Because according to the Milankovitch theory, right now at this point, point in time, we should be at the onset of a new ice age. And um, the, the reason we're not, is because of changing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, because it's not only solar insulation that determines where we're at with regards to glacial inception, so the onset of a new ice age, but also the CO2 content uh, in the atmosphere. And we found a critical relationship between those two, basically a curve that says, well, if you're above that, um, then there is the possibility for the onset of a new ice age. And if you're below it, um, it's not possible. And that depends both on the insulation as well as the CO2 concentration. Now, um, down here, you see a very complex graph. But basically, this is just saying that all these um, blue bars, they show um, the onset of new ice ages over the past 800,000 years. And just... Um, validates this, uh, this critical threshold. And to the right, you also see what could potentially happen in different futures, namely futures that are um, characterized by different the CO2 content or, content or um, gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. And what we find is that um, we actually had a narrow escape from new asset. It was roughly a CO2 concentration change of 40 ppm that made the difference between entering a new ice age or not. And also you see when you look at the, those future curves that even if there were no additional emissions at this point, so if we just um, stopped emitting CO2 um, right now, then still we would have postponed the next ice age for at least 50,000 years. So that's half a glacial cycle already. And I think it really shows that humans have become a geological force. Now, it may it well have been that early anthropogenic change, that 40 ppm difference that kind of kicked us into a feedback loop, a feedback loop between, um, well, niche construction, energy um, consumption, and also population growth. And now the question, or one of the questions that we're asking ourselves, first of all, how did that potentially bring about the emergence of the, uh, of the technosphere, but also could there be a permanent restructuring of the Earth system and its entire dynamic regime. Yeah, and since we are scientists, uh, that means we are looking for a proper equation. And actually we found one uh, called the Anthropocene equation. So what Ricardo just showed, that onset of this dynamic uh, goes into uh, also so circling back to Ursula's talk, uh, it created a closing of a positive feedback loop between population growth, niche construction, especially knowledge production and energy use. And once that uh, feedback loop was closed a couple of thousand years ago, we entered a new dynamic. And this is the dynamic that the Anthropocene equation uh, basically describes. I show it here very quickly. That is the most simplistic form. It actually gets then very quickly more complicated because it becomes an exponential uh, uh, growth curve. But uh, it's a very straightforward relationship between what we call the social metabolic rate, that's the Y, uh, the basically maintenance rate of energy use, that's what the amount of energy that the system needs to, pers uh, to persist as a system, and then the growth component, what energy is sort of left uh, for the system to grow. Uh, we derive that equation from, out from an understanding of how biology works, because in biology, we also have a metabolic, basic biological metabolic rate. Uh, it is the, defined as the rate to which energy needs to be supplied for the organism to live, to be active, and to reproduce. So basically, what drives the biosphere. If we look at this, then about 8,000 years ago, just before that 
uh, early anthropogenic change that uh, Ricarda was talking about, uh, we all behaved like we should. We were a bipedal naked ape. And on the metabolic scaling curve, you see us right there between the elephant and the mouse. And what that means is basically that our natural metabolic rate, energy consumption, is about 90 watts a day. That was 8,000 years ago. Our current social metabolic rate is more than 11,000 watts, two orders of magnitude more. So if you go back to the diagram, then you see for anybody who believes in scaling relationships, this is bad news. There is a total change of the system because we are way off the chart. It's a logarithmic scale, by the way. Otherwise, we would be in the 17th floor or something like that. Okay, so what's going on? So this, uh, what we did, we introduced the social metabolic rate. Uh, so we needed, what energy do we need to maintain our constructed niches, basically? Uh, and then what energy is left to grow? And that's why that feedback loop is between population growth, the knowledge that we acquire to extract and use more energy that feeds population growth. And that positive feedback loop has been going on for the last 8,000 years. And uh, what's new here is basically that we are now no longer just a biological individual. We are what we call an extended individual. That is us and all our infrastructure combined. And to give you a, a, a rough estimate, because some people who study the technosphere uh, try to figure out how heavy the technosphere is. So, and those are all low-balling estimates. But if you take that low-balling estimate seriously, every one of you carries with you 30,000 tons. That is more than the weight of the Brooklyn Bridge. Every individual 30, plus 30,000 tons. That is the extended individual of today. Okay, now we have the equation again. Yeah, and of course, we're dealing with a growth equation and we're dealing with an acceleration and a rescaling, and that means that there is potential for collapse. Now, um, the question is what prevented collapse in the past and what might potentially prevent it in the future? And this is where innovation and knowledge actually play a crucial role. Now, just um, to bring this back to, to present day and to what is actually at stake. Um, so here you see um, a, a new map of the current understanding of our core tipping elements. There are also regional tipping elements, um, but they, um, they go from the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica to the Atlantic Meridian overturning circulation to major biomes like the Amazon rainforest and also the boreal forest, um, uh, as well as the boreal permafrost. Now, what they have in common, um, as uh, was already defined, is that a tiny perturbation, once they're in a critical state, can qualitatively alter their state and potentially also lead to changes of the Earth system as a whole. But this is still very much ongoing research trying to understand this. So if we go back to our temperature trajectory of the past and potential future trajectories, if you now overlay this with our current understanding of the tipping thresholds um, of all these individual tipping elements, then this is what we get. So uh, the gray bar here that you see that is the Paris range of 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming. And you see that there is a, a cluster of tipping elements, including West Antarctica, Greenland, um, the Alpine Glacier and Coral Reefs. Um, for which um, the, there is a growing risk to already trigger at least parts uh, of their tipping potential within that Paris range of 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming. Um, now, in order to understand their interactions, we actually have to combine our Earth system understanding uh, with network analysis. So um, here we, you, you see a study where we uh, looked at the interactions between um, those four tipping elements, so Greenland, Antarctica, uh, the AMOC, uh, so the Atlantic Meridian Overturning Circulation, and the Amazon Rainforest. Um, and we looked at all kinds of uncertainties because we're dealing with a nonlinear phenomenon. So there, there are certainly uncertainties around the critical thresholds, the interaction strength, and so on. Um, but with um, network analysis um, that actually allows us to look at potential domino effects in that system. And we find that some of those domino effects could already occur um, at 1.5 to 2 degrees of global warming. And also it teaches us something about the role of different parts of the Earth system. So for instance, we find that the polar ice sheets often act as initiators of domino effects or tipping cascades. 
Um, and that shows us how important those polar regions are also uh, for us here in the mid latitudes. Now, one of the goals needs to be to close the loop between our understanding of those biogeophysical interactions um, with the socio -tech technosphere. Um, and of course, attitudes, policies, uh, and behavior change, both individual as well as collective behavior, would play a really important role here. Because what we want to understand is um, th there might be a potential that the great acceleration curve just continues um, as it did for the past decades. But the question is, how can we curb that great acceleration? What are the critical intervention points that would actually lead us from this red trajectory here to something more of that blue stabilization trajectory? And from a system dynamics viewpoint, that's the dif difference between failure dynamics and regeneration dynamics. So the question is, which role does individual and human agent, uh, collective human agency actually play in deciding which of these pathways we as the, the human Earth system are going to take? And, um, and also, there's a question, is the Anthropocene a continuous process or is it a trigger to switch the planet between states? And I would argue that we actually don't know that yet. Um, so this is uh, just uh, one depiction of a stability landscape. And while we know a lot about what happened in the past where we had glacial cycles um, and basically went through a glacial interglacial limit cycle, and we kind of know where we're at at the moment, it's really difficult to say how that stability landscape looks like for potential future trajectories. So there might be something like a hothouse earth state. There might also be something like a stabilized earth state. What is clear though, is not only are we moving through that stability landscape, but we as humans actually, because we have knowledge, because we have foresight and anticipation um, and agency, we are actually able to also change that stability landscape. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion and the question of time in there. Uh, clearly, uh, time is an important part of geoanthropology. How much time do we have? Uh, what are the different temporal scales? But time is, of course, also something that, uh, that Jürgen has been very much involved in, particularly also in his work with Hanoch and others, uh, trying to figure out what happened between Newtonian and Einsteinian time, so to speak. And there is a simple transformation, uh, the Lorentz transformation that explains that. Uh, every one of us has many experiences with Jürgen, and we know that there is another concept of time that we call Jürgen time. And the question is what kind of transformation it is to understand Jürgen time uh, defies the abilities of mathematics. And, uh, but on the other hand, it also means uh, Jürgen time, that means having been uh, Don Quixote and getting the new institute off the ground means that it's crucial uh, for the temporal component of solving the problems of geoanthropology. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for these insights into the new institute. Um, we have time for one short immediate question or we move into the general discussion, your choice. No question. Okay, thanks again. And now it's uh, up to Anna Simois and Maria Paula Diogo from the University of Lisbon and the Nova University of Lisbon to talk about, well, no surprise here, crisis in the Anthropocene. Thank you. So, so I can't move too much. Okay, okay. So um, we are also following our colleagues 
preceding our lecture, uh, presenting this one uh, as a duo. Um, the format is a little bit different, but uh, what we really want to, to say first is to thank to be here. Um, I mean, to be invited to, to participate in these three days, honoring the intellectual and institutional achievements of Jürgen Rehn throughout a very, I mean, a very rich career. And let me just point that I still remember uh, former colleagues uh, in the physics department three decades or so ago coming to the ICTP, which was a sort of a haven on earth for uh, communities of physicists uh, in peripheral countries and underdeveloped countries. So we have been <laughs> making lots of analogies, but maybe Abdul Salam, uh, Jurgen Ren is also the Abdul Salam of our community and of this uh, rethinking about our position on Earth. And so we are uh, taking a different approach than our colleagues to dealing with what we call crisis in the Anthropocene. And I will start and then Paula will uh, proceed. Um, as historians of science and technology, we uh, are reflecting also uh, from a very different perspective on these questions. Uh, the our first take is also to think about history of science and technology as a unit, not as separate disciplines and uh, as part of humanities and to try to figure out and to understand how they may help to address present uh, problems of concern to present day societies. And uh, we will start by uh, background, which uh, in a sense explains to you how we have arrived at these discussions. Uh, and we will then summarize very, very briefly two uh, international and independent research networks uh, which played uh, um, an enormous influence in our uh, views. The science and technology in the European periphery, STEP, in fact, uh, one of the, the brains behind STEP was Costa de Gavroglu and the Tensions of Europe program. They have both coexisted in time from 1999 to 2014, 2014, giving way eventually to our other groups, but certainly influencing the way members of uh, participants in these projects uh, thought about their, their, their job. Those uh, two uh, independent research groups uh, were very keen on trying to dissect the conceptual meanings of Europe. And it is having this framework in mind that we will address two topics which we consider to be uh, really important. Crisis on one sense and the Anthropocene on the other hand. We believe that both step and tensions of Europe agendas and the debates on crisis and the Anthropocene call for a long durée perspective and for an attitude of resilience against both technophobia and technophilia contributing to ongoing debates by revealing past decisions, strategies, and options that shaped the contemporary societies. So we deem that they are critical to better understand today's uh, society and, propose, and to propose active agendas that may influence public, public opinion and policymakers. As such, it is our contention that these two interrelated topics deserve particular uh, attention from scholars in our field. And I will very briefly summarize for you the major uh, achievements or the major uh, methodological rationale of both science and technology in the European periphery and the tensions of Europe, because some of you might not be uh, that aware of, of them. They had complementary approaches to the history of science and technology, but both encourage case studies and their relation to a larger regional, transnational and or European framework. STEP's agenda stressed the concepts of appropriation, circulation, mediation and innovation, and was particularly concerned with the historicization of the notion of European periphery, and in fact, the notion also of European science. What does it mean to talk in these terms? Uh, are we losing anything or are we gaining anything. 
approaching local studies under such theoretical umbrella, it is possible to reinforce the concept of co-constructions and center of centers and peripheries. So the idea was to keep the words, but um, giving them different meanings. And uh, Paul and myself are still um, certain that uh, even in the present era of global studies, they can still play a role. And maybe this will be clear in what follows. So um, we really wanted to reinforce the concept of co-construction of centers and peripheries to go beyond the course of the fixed geographies. In fact, some of us introduced the idea of moving local localities and the idea of co-construction of moving localities. It was also possible to bring in, in this in this context, it was possible that the center was to bring to the forefront the perspective of active receivers, often dismissed from global accounts based on simplistic and static divide between the global north, which is active, and the global south, which is passive. And finally, to fully participate in the ongoing debate on the relevance of science and technology as a global phenomenon closely related with the discussion of progress itself. The Tensions of Europe Research Network built on two main conceptual tools, the idea of a hidden technology-driven agenda for European integration, as opposed to the explicit economic, financial, and political integrative policies, and the notions that in this integration there were tensions as well as dialogues. There were, there were linkings and delinkings, which explored the ever-changing asymmetries within Europe and between Europe and the global world. And so even in the context of global uh, history, we really think that uh, Europe has still a role to play in the sense that even, even uh, when we look at Europe, there are lots of diversity that we tend to, to, to reduce and so, and, and in any case, you, Europe never existed without its interconnections with the, the world. So the four main assumptions that supported the research framework of the first Tensions of Europe program, and which gave way to six volumes that you know very well, the Making Europe series, were first, this long durée narrative, second, the relevance of material networks, technological systems, and circulation of knowledge, practices, and artifacts. Third, the need to place the histories of Europe in a global worldwide dynamic perspective. And fourth, the need to review the current understanding of the process of European integration in order to highlight its bottom-up dimension. Beyond this research agenda, tensions of Europe also encourage a strong commitment to contemporary issues. And so it is at crossroads of the science and technology in the European periphery and the tensions of Europe agendas and inspired by their conceptual frameworks that we highlight these two topics, crisis and the Anthropocene as research areas worthy of attention. So let me uh, address crisis. The rhetoric of, and discourses on crisis are rooted in a wider sense of loss and frustration, very much based on the perception that human ability to commend nature does not need, lead necessarily to increasing well being, and that resources are indeed finite. Of course, this is not new in academic discussions among historians of science and technology. However, the idea of a linear, continuous, and good growth and progress, which is at the heart of industrial capitalism is still a doxa, in the sense that for most people, this constructed vision appears to be the only possible vision of reality. The growing evidence that this narrative does not match reality recreates then a civilizational instability that finds its natural habitat in a series of never ending slow moving crises in what uh, Rosalind Williams called the rolling apocalypse of contemporary history in the sense that there is an end in sight. If humanity's actions in nature and society do not change drastically. So these this two new, new concepts of slow moving crises and the rolling apocalypse, which we were put forward to by Rosalind Williams will 
be addressed by us in a very summarized and short way. Having in mind the present predicament humanity finds itself in, and uh, I mean, the former speakers have addressed this issue, Rosalind Williams introduced this concept of slow moving crises as an alternative to the former long time notion that crises are a sort of singular and abrupt events in space and time. And she uh, highlighted the fact that events, um, that, that slow moving, that crises are not events, but are on the other hand processes, which unfold in extended periods and regions throughout long periods of time. So they are part of a long sequence of what she has dubbed slow moving crises in order to stress this uh, long durée perspective. Uh, and eventually uh, arriving at a, a, a rolling apocalypse. So her take on the concept of slow moving crisis uh, and the rolling apocalypse not only stresses this idea that crises are processes, that there is not, uh, there is not uh, it's difficult to uh, pinpoint a very clear cause or a consequence, uh, we have to look elsewhere. But also, she has uh, also pointed to the fact that these concepts might have the danger of easily discarding the actors that are part of the crisis, thinking about them as a sort of a cascading crisis and natural events and not really human-made events. So following her lead, we suggest that as historians, we should be able to use these lenses of science and technology to address in an innovative way the concept of crisis by asking questions, some of which uh, you can see here and which for reasons of time, I will uh, skip. So the context of pandemics we still find ourselves in provides an illustration of the potential of Williams concept of slow moving crisis by forcing scholars to contextualize this specific crisis as part and parcel of a long sequence of interlocking events of dimensions that, of course, go much beyond the strictly medical one. They include human and non-human relations, conditions for disease propagation and for public health control, confinement versus prevention mechanism strategies, individual, also the balance between individual freedom of choice and state control over individual actions, the boundaries between democratic and autocratic regimes, and the various gradations in the belief in the value of science and technology in society. As many historians of science and technology, we have used this opportunity uh, provided by the pandemic to show how our disciplinary perspective can enrich present debates. And in fact, we looked at uh, it through uh, a topic in which we were working at the moment, uh, which was the urban history of science and technology in Lisbon from the 19th to the 20th century, and various chapters of a forthcoming edited volume to appear in the series C Cultural Dynamics of Science by Brill, which in fact will come out next week, deal precisely with public health issues at Lisbon in, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century and the pr protection of the port city from the ravaging effects of epidemics coming by sea, uh, mostly uh, yellow fever and cholera. So they were the springboard for our revisitation of the theme under the present context. And we offer very, very brief comments on this. Uh, epidemics, we are now so very well aware of these are part of the web of interactions which mark the urban space, introducing the risk disruptive elements in a fragile balance of forces, either caused by suddenly, suddenly change of the status quo, but also because they force changes in urban spaces, um, either because they are suddenly change, um, they force changes in urban spaces and in the behavior of those who inhabit them from experts to common citizens. And from the medieval Black Death uh, to COVID-19, this pattern still persists, justifying a renewed vision of urban history of science encompassing urban history of science, technology, and medicine. 
And let's look backward at the 19th century city. The European rate of urbanization accelerated in the 19th and the 20th century, including both the expansion of a large central European cities, much like Paris, London, and Berlin, but also of smaller cities, which have been made invisible, like Lisbon or Porto, for example. The new 19th century city, in fact, was mostly a Haussmannian city, modern, cosmopolitan, conceived to serve the, per, the, the aims of an emerging middle class. And it was in this context that gray and green infrastructures, that is hidden infrastructures like sewage, lighting, water supply, but also visible infrastructures like gardens, boulevards, avenues, transport, and leisure and consumption areas, as well as public health and hygiene regulations were at the heart of the, a new urbanity built by different classes of experts. And they were scientists, engineers, and physicians who formed the new technocracy, which assumed the fundamental role in urban matters and in informing political decisions. But the glare of the Haussmannian city has made invisible to the eyes of contemporary modernity another city within the city. And these were the city of the poor, that is of the working class that migrated into the cities and lived in very precarious housing and hygienic conditions and neighborhoods. This city becomes visible during epidemics because diseases found it in their found in them privileges, spaces to blossom and expand. And this happened, of course, in Lisbon uh, during the epidemics in the second half of the 19th century and still happened today. So this was uh, part of some of the chapters we addressed in this volume. But what I want to mention now is that this kind of historical research on how societies have dealt in the past with epidemics and pandemics enable better to navigate the current moments of uncertainty and bewilderment and articulate future actions effective in reversing the conditions that stopped the world in the beginning of the 21st century. If we address the pandemic as a singular event, not as a process, and miss to see it as a, pro, a part of a succession of slow moving crises following Rosalind Williams, in the coming pandemic, we risk to fulfill the famous prediction of Karl Marx in the opening of the 18th Primaire of Louis Bonaparte. History repeats itself, first time as a tragedy, the second as a farce. And now it's the turn of I will my move colleague. to our second topic, how to address the concept of the Anthropocene and its relevance as a historical category within the problematic of history of science and technology, which is in fact closely related to the concept of crisis and the question of human agency. So science and technology are definitely at the core of the Anthropocene. In our opinion, historians of science and technology should engage in the debate of the Anthropocene, first by discussing if the concept is useful as an historical category, secondly, using their own analytical tools to dissect some of the assumptions behind the concept itself, and third, by crossing concepts used in our field of expertise with the rationale behind the Anthropocene. One of the things that trouble us the most in our first immersion in the Anthropocene debates, actually during the, one of the first Anthropocene campus led by Jürgen and Berndt, uh, was the realization that most accounts on the Anthropocene were and still are uh, dehistoricized. That is, human agency translated into economic and political systems dissolves in a quite generic narrative, which balances between Jean-Jacques Rousseau's mystification of nature and George Orwell's dystopia of omnipresent technological surveillance. Furthermore, as far as science and technology are concerned, the idea of a quasi autonomous technosphere that our colleagues just mentioned in their talk is particularly close for an historian of science and technology to technological determinism and oblivious of the human nature of science and technology. And close really to another concept that is being uh, uh, discussed further, which is uh, technofixes itself. So that's something we are also discussing. Finally, another disturbing implication of this ahistoricity of the usual concept of the Anthropocene 
is the use precise of we and us as if human society was an homogeneous, flat and free floating reality. For an historian, it is extremely difficult to use terms such as we or us. We talk about classes, groups, uh, lobbying uh, groups, something like that, but never the we. A growing number of authors actually consider that discourse on the Anthropocene inherently emphasizes the urgency of global solutions for a global problem caused by humanity as a whole, intentionally leveling socioeconomic differences and concealing political conflicts. These authors, which are very popular, uh, propose alternative concepts to describe the age of human humankind, particularly by stressing the role played by different forms of capitalism, including the so-called state capitalism, in the unbuilt exploitation of natural resources, thus bringing to the forefront the divide between those who are explored and those who explore. Colonial and post-colonial studies also respond to this criticism by discussing our European colonial science, technology, and medicine anchor the new global worldwide epistemology and idea of progress and growth that profoundly changed the very concept of ecology, both in colonial and post-colonial uh, periods. In this new context, there is lots of room for historians of science and technology to participate and help to reinforce the human dimension in the present narratives on the Anthropocene by following the changes in natural and human landscapes using science and technology as an heterogeneous ensemble of mechanisms that enforce and reinforce, in fact, power of nature uh, fr framed by economic and political objectives. In our view, the relevant question concerning time and the Anthropocene is not the building of a chronology of events or the discussion of its starting point, though it's interesting by itself, of course, but the addition of temporality of a long durée perspective from the historical perspective to the discussion in order to seize the intertwined movements of different historical scales. As historians of science and technology, but the same applies for philosophers and sociologists of science and technology, it is our responsibility to encourage an historicized account of the Anthropocene. Furthermore, the Anthropocene framework enables historians of science and technology, technology to test many of our concepts and theoretical apparatuses in order to assess their plasticity and robustness. Examples of such concepts that we all know are biopolitics, biopower, biofacts, technology of the body, of the land, of the state, milieu interior, technopolitics, technoeconomics, technological determinism and its uh, criticism, actor, actor network theory and practice theory. In a nutshell, the issue of science and technology can contribute to enrich the ongoing debate on the Anthropocene, as well as the extent to which this concept is useful also for historical analysis. In what follows, we give a specific example in which we have been working, uh, um, which, in which we have been working, and we here is the group in uh, our research unit in Lisbon, Portugal. It is an example which makes clear how the input from the history of science and technology may help to dissect the nature culture technology dichotomy and help reassess the nature of nature which is, in our uh, opinion, central to the Anthropocene debate. By following the changes in natural and human landscapes, using science and technology as mechanisms framed by economic and political objectives, we argue that they not only enforce and reinforce power over nature, as we just mentioned, but they, also they are also responsible for the demise of the utopian separation between nature and culture technology. As such, they are behind our proposal to introduce the concept of loop in nature. We built on an analogy to the Marxist concept and well-known concept of loop and proletariat in order to highlight the demise of nature as an independent entity and to stress its constitutive technological dimension. And as such, we go a step forward from the idea of technologization of nature to assert the creation of a technological nature, a techno nature that is a loop and nature. Historians of science and technology have introduced concepts such as naturalization of technology, technologization of nature. They do not imply, though, uh, none of them, a perception of nature and technology as balanced sides of a pair. 
In fact, in both instances, technology is the driving force of the analysis, either by imposing itself as the so-called second nature and reclaiming its status as a form of life, or by domesticating and controlling nature by transforming landscapes and ecosystems to enhance food and energy supplies, both on local and global scales. On the other hand, philosophers and historians have been stressed all along the 20th century, the past historical account did not make room for uh, nature. That is, there was an absence of nature per se in history and as history, in the sense that mainstream narrative natures was never taken as a, an historical actor. And reacting to this persistent situation, they have called attention to the visible and invisible entanglements of nature technology and humans. Let us just remind the Codes Anal, uh, Kranzberg, Purcell, Benjamin, Shatsky, the 1960s debate on cultural nature divide, and more recent scholarship on the topic. It is having this concept in mind that we propose to go a step further and introduce the notion of technological nature. By this new concept, we mean artificial and digital representations of the world that fulfill our inborn affiliation with the environment without engaging in nature. In this sense, this new technological nature is a loop in nature deprived of its primal values and inherently framed by technology. We are aware that this technological nature contaminates the essence of what has been perceived in the past as true nature eventually leading to its dissolution as a category. We are reminded of McKibben's statement in the end of nature. We have deprived nature of its independence and this is, this is fatal, fatal to its meaning. Nature's independence is its meaning. Without it, there is nothing but us. And so what he, what he tries to, to tell us is that in fact, it may look like nature, but it isn't. In fact, it, had, it has become a resource. So just for some conclusions, by crossing concepts such as crisis and Anthropocene with the theoretical frameworks of both step and tensions of Europe, historians of science and technology can historicize and endow them with new dimensions or with dimensions which have remained so far in the dark. The relevance of local contexts transnational expertise and objects, colonialism and imperialism are just a few examples of topics to be repressed. Addressed from a new perspective centered in, on Europe, but deeply critical of Eurocentrism, the consideration of the dynamic evolution of extended global networks enables us to relocate on new grounds the building of local asymmetries. Following the reflections of a participant in one of the Anthropocene campus, Clapperton Mavungas, uh, we extend the questioning of who's Anthropocene to who's crisis. So the recognition of the dire impact of asymmetries on present day problems calls for solutions involving an ample participation of diverse constituencies. The importance of history of science and technology as a particular area within the humanities become, in our perspective, obvious. So thank you all, and thank you again, Jürgen, for this long-lasting collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Paula, for this insightful talk. I, we have time for one immediate question, and in the time in between, I ask the presenters to come to the podium. Ricarda, Ursula, Manfred, and we can have, a, I would say, in interest of time, a 15-minute general discussion before Baron Chera will have the concluding remarks. Yeah, okay? Okay. Have a seat. If there, you are in need of an extra mic, I will certainly help. Do you need a chair? Or you are the, you are the left outsider? Okay, cool. Questions to the podium. Well, then, then I would start. Actually, I think that all of your three talks, actually, I should say five talks in a way, have mentioned the interaction, the interaction of. Take the mask off. Did I take the mask off? Yes, you cannot understand. We cannot understand you. <laughs> you don't understand me. Do you understand no. me now? Yes. yes, that's better. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, 
we'll wait for you for, for him. No, no worries. <laughs> it's, it's just so now we have questions. Actually, yes, I have first Gabi, then I have Jurgen, and then Gabi is first. I, I found this a fascinating session, but I have something that does bother me, and I want a little enlightenment about it, which is this. Uh, it concerns global warming, the emergency catastrophism, and everything else, which is that even if all of this were not to happen, the Earth all on its own would change. We don't know how or when or where, but we would, I imagine, with the development of science, be able to measure that change and to say, where we are in the process. And the reason I'm thinking this is you could construct a theory which would say that global warming is an excellent thing because it's preventing the onset of the new ice age, if you thought that were about to happen. So you see, so the question is, do we have any kind of data about where we are? As somebody said, like it prevented a new, that, that human activity had prevented a new ice age. Do we, what kind of data do we have? about the underlying process, as it were, if it were not affected by human beings. So we can measure the differential of what human beings do to what would happen anyway, where what would happen anyway is not a constant. I think that's a question to Ricardo, right? Right, thank you very much for that for that question. I think it's an important one. And of course, um, we're dealing all the time in Earth system science also with counterfactuals. And this is where um, we bring together the, our different uh, methods, um, both including paleo evidence, including observations, but also including modeling um, in order to understand what those counterfactuals would be. So where would we be um, without humans on earth? And um, a, a common example where this is being used is for for instance, for the attribution of extreme events uh, to um, uh, anthropogenic climate change. So um, here's a technique where basically what the question that we're trying to address is how much more likely um, has, for instance, this um, heat wave in, in Europe that we've just been through, how much more likely has that become due to anthropogenic climate change? Um, and so there, there's a whole field of science that deals with exactly this type of question. Now to your first remark, I think that this is also an important one because of course, um, in a way we have kind of made that narrow escape from a potential new ice age. So if we were just considering the Milankovitch theory, we might as well be at the onset of a new ice age. So um, I, I think we need to regard this as some kind of corridor of temperatures where humans uh, thrive basically and um, that, that we've been living in uh, for the past thousands of years. So I think um, it's important while we very much focus on global warming because that's our current trajectory and this is um, this causes a lot of immediate problems. Um, it's also important to understand that there is actually this, this corridor um, that makes uh, the planet Earth most habitable or, or livable. <laughs> If I can add a few things, so you're absolutely right. Everything is changing all the time. You know, Heraclitus knew that. Uh, evolution says pretty much the same thing. Uh, the interesting question is, what type of change are we talking about? And uh, of course, it's all in a sense relative to our desire to uh, remain alive as a species. Uh, the bad news is that no species has ever remained alive for a particularly long period of time. Uh, so uh, that is an inevitable fate. But you know, given the self-interest, what we are seeing right now is that if you emphasize the niche construction dimension of our actions, that they are on a qualitatively different scale than uh, what any other species managed to do before us. There were events like the great oxidation event that basically wiped out a major part of all life on earth because oxygen became poisonous to all the previous life forms, but that took much longer. So we are somewhere in between the great oxidation event and the nuclear winter, closer to the side of the nuclear winter. And so the question is, what are the implications of that dynamic? Quite, quite negative. Jürgen Joost, and then me. Yeah, thanks for this very inspiring presentations. 
I have a couple of perhaps somewhat critical questions. First of all, when you write on the Earth equation, you have an equation with three variables, but only a single equation, and it doesn't really explicitly contain the feedback loop. So, in, and, but on the other hand, the system should be modeled as a closed system. So you cannot do it with externalities. So somehow you need a system of equations to describe that. You need to amplify that then. Secondly, the tools that you described or that you suggested were all relatively old tools developed in other fields. There were these tipping points, of course, is called what is bifurcation theory or some by some people called, uh, called catastrophe theory in the 1960s. And then you, uh, there were some suggestions of chaos theory that was developed by, by physicists in the 70s and 80s. And then there was network analysis, which was developed by social scientists and by biologists many decades ago. Is this the right box of tools that you have, or doesn't the problem need different formal, conceptual, mathematical tools, and how would they have to be developed? Then thirdly, if we follow Derrida, every narrative or theory has kind of a blind spot. And so there may be some blind spots here, and in particular, one of the blind spots may be the role of the scientists here. So we are not only the scientists who as engineers build up the technosphere, we are not only the scientists who try to find remedies and try to under, understand the dynamics. We are also scientists who have to interact in a particular way with the public sphere. And so we need to, re we need to be critical of our role. We take a strongly moralizing attitude here, which we think is, is the appropriate one, but the actions of the public may be not what we expect and what we want to have here. And so in order to really have a closed system, we also need to model our, all, our own role of scientists in that system and try to understand that from a perhaps more independent perspective. So uh, very good remarks, uh, particularly uh, what you described uh, in the second half of your comment uh, to actually also model the consequences of our actions and knowledge generation this is really what we need to get into this, and this is where we don't really have the tools. As for the equation, it's the simplest form that we wrote down there, but basically you can reduce it because you have a strong correlation between population size and time. Uh, so you can basically set those equivalent. So it's basically an equation between energy and time slash population size. But, uh, uh, and you know that this equation gets more complicated very quickly didn't want to present that here. Um, but uh, I think your remark about uh, what are the adequate tools and what else needs to be considered besides this coarse graining of the dynamic based on basically the currency of energy. And the reason why we did it on energy is because we wanted to get this dynamic into the models of earth system science which are basically models that operate on energy so that's a way to link that up and bring sort of one form of human dynamic into earth system science and then uh, to capture the complexities of the coevolutionary dynamics including the role of the scientists that you said this is where we are not sure that we have all the tools so there's work for you guys to do Maybe I can just add to that. So thanks, I, I, really, really important questions. And uh, just on that last point, maybe actually think of the first talk of this conference where we're thinking about that, that feedback loop between language and, and basically what happens in our brain, the difference between exogenous and endogenous um, effects. And so it, it just made me think that, um, yes, of course, we scientists are part of those feedback loops and it would be really interesting to, to try to disentangle this um, similar to what we saw uh, in the first presentation, kind of the, the role of knowledge and the role of also the development of methods and, and knowledge um, in those feedback loops. It's a very interesting point. Yeah, first of all, I have to congratulate you because in less than two hours, you represented the entire Anthropocene debate. 
I mean, really from all disciplinary angles. And it also shows that uh, contributions, both from the natural science perspective, from the modeling perspective, and from the history of science are really useful. Uh, but that immediately leads me to my question, how can these disciplinary perspectives be brought more closely together? <clears throat> I think, Ursula, you showed us very uh, clearly how important it is to assess the conceptual state of certain uh, uh, developments, to distinguish, <clears throat> to get away from sort of muddled use of, uh, of distinctions, and, and you made it very clear. But it's also clear that this is just the beginning, because you showed us the beginning point and, and the end point. And, and, and Paola uh, and Anna, you showed us, uh, you know, the tendency of the humanities to differentiate to go from the global to the local, to the differentiation and to the internal tensions that are within the concept, also very important. But my question, I really have two questions. One is uh, from what we see, what we learn about the global dynamics that Ricarda and Manfred have shown us so vividly, there is not just a need for differentiation, there's also a need for represent, representing the global situation in the local minds, so to say. And shouldn't we as humanists also take this challenge seriously? How can you know, we bring this kind of global situation into the consciousness, into the awareness of people who have in their daily lives very different problems, very different perspective, very different backgrounds. And yet we, we somehow have to understand ourselves as part of one humanity uh, challenged by the same kind of global problems. So, the question is not just to go from the global to the local, but also how to represent the global in the local. That seems to be, and that is one question. And the second question is, how can these different approaches be brought more closely together? And I think there, the, uh, the quotation with which Ursula ended from Prigogine seems to be uh, sort of, uh, for me, quite, uh, quite useful because it shows that it is not just a matter, Jürgen, of introducing ever more complex mathematics uh, to get ever more complex uh, uh, formal representation, but it's also a fact of, you know, criticizing models, uh, uh, getting an epistemological perspective on them, uh, realizing where their shortcomings are in a kind of iterative process of critique and constructive model building. It's almost like, you know, internalization and externalization. So I think the challenge for the future would really be to bring these perspectives even more closely together. Uh, you know, you're all sitting next to each other. That's wonderful for me to see. But I think in the future, we need to think of forms of collaboration that bring these perspectives even more closely together. If so, I but, may briefly yeah. answer to this, uh, the, to the question how to bring the global perspective to the public. I think this is not just um, an issue that concerns the scientists. The global perspective is also present in religion, philosophy, the arts, and so on. For a scientist, I think it, it is more the question of how we bring the global, the global perspective into the picture. And in this respect, I think and here I would join you that we also have as historians of science and philosophers of science to critically rethink the way in which the scientists do this. Uh, as I said in my talk, I mean, in, in the 80, 1980s, the earth scientists took the system's perspective from outside. It is that was not the, the global perspective was not was not an an issue that was that that a challenging uh, problem within that perspective. It came from outside and it was taken as a postulate. It was and I think in most in, in current earth system sciences is still the case. The question of whether there is a single earth system or whether there are different systems that interact and co-evolve. Co-evolution is not the same. Co-evolution means there are different systems that interact. So uh, these kinds of questions have to be, first of all, to be rethought by us. And this is not done because in earth system science, the, the issue, it, the, the attitude is, let's take this as a postulate that the earth is a single system and see what we can do with it. 
it is it is an approach, a kind of tool, but it is not a concept that is really that can be justified. I don't know how, how it could be justified. I think it cannot be justified, certainly not empirically. And there is no deductive way to justify that the Earth is a single system. So these kinds of issues have to be discussed by us when we, I mean, we are not prophets or as scientists, but we have very specific, in, in, in distinction to artists and in distinction perhaps even to philosophers, we have very distinctive uh, tasks to address the audience. Maybe a quick correction by, by Paula. I'll try to be brief. I think that the what we can do is to continue to have the Anthropocene campus. It's, in fact, it's a place where we have been able to discuss with our colleagues from the sciences. Uh, sometimes we have very different perspectives, so it's difficult to, uh, to close the gap between these perspectives. It's not something that is easy to, to, to do. So it takes a lot of work and takes a lot of time to do it, but it's possible, of course. And on the other hand, we have a, a major problem that is the idea that we can, in a way, um, bring our uh, thoughts and rationality on the Anthropocene to everybody in the globe. Because in fact, if we take, for instance, the example from the Anthropocene campus themselves, where we had people from Africa or from South America, they were much more interested in questions concerning how do we live uh, without water than discussing the Anthropocene as a concept. And uh, there were much more practical issues. And also the, the, this idea that, in fact, uh, we don't have the same, we don't, the globe, the, not everybody in the globe has the same uh, way of regarding and uh, perce uh, perceiving the world. And as uh, our colleague mentioned uh, on the, 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 that uh, uh, question from our colleague over there, is that in fact the problem ra is raised because we human, uh, uh, humans as a species doesn't want, don't want to disappear because uh, the earth will continue without us. So. It's not the first time that there is a, a massive extinction. So the problem is that we feel that we have the, 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 the tools to avoid it. We understand that we have technological tools that can avoid it. We know that there are questions concerning politics and economics and everybody, all uh, governments know what the situation is. So it's not the problem of lack of information. It's a problem concerning what do we want to do? It's not a question that we don't know how to solve it. It's do we want to solve it and how? And this is quite interesting. We had a, a, um, an interview from a, 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 a chief from uh, the Amazonian, one of the Amazonian tribes. And he mentioned precisely one of the questions that we have been discussing, which is the large quantity of funding, for instance, for programs concerning uh, going to Mars. What does this mean in terms of politics, of decisions? So that's difficult. And of course, it takes time if we have it or not. And I'm not sure <laughs> for the moment. Briefly, Ricardo. Yeah, just to make maybe one link um, uh, that um, Jürgen mentioned. Um, just to kind of link to, to your presentation, and I probably had such an important point of um, introducing temporality. And I think this is something that um, we struggle with from different perspectives in a way, because also in the earth system, we have these different um, temporalities. So we have processes that happen at very different time scales. And even within those processes, um, there's always, um, for instance, let's say uh, if we talk about um, the loss of, of the green ice sheet or part of the green ice sheet, there's the time until that um, particular process is actually triggered, and then there's the time it takes to unfold uh, for that process. So dealing with these kinds of temporalities, I think that could be a really interesting way of approaching um, the, the problem from different perspectives. So I, I very much appreciated that. We have to explore uh, different ways of communicating that and communicating across I'm sorry, yeah, I'm too far away. 
I really think that this goes back to the beginning of the, this, this whole workshop and the discussions about language communication, ways of communication, and uh, really exploring how to do it in uh, creative ways. And uh, so we are back to the beginning with lots of uh, promises and, I think, and also dangers. Of can, can I add uh, something? So, um, um, so um, uh, uh, as, uh, about the comment of uh, Jost. So I think that um, we should uh, look into what uh, is happening now uh, in, nowadays in science, because uh, what all the concepts that were well established in the past, okay, can be a resource to 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 face the, the new problems. But there is also uh, things that are happening now in science, and the younger people know very well that are new tools to to analyze. Uh, quantitatively systems like ecological systems or uh, um, concepts like quantitative sustainability. And, uh, and these are the product of uh, uh, a new science that emerged in the last 20 years, which is an, a better knowledge of happens in systems out of equilibrium systems that are uh, 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 subjected to to noise and to stochastic noises, and uh, uh, and I, I don't think there is a broad knowledge of what what uh, has been done in this uh, field. Uh, I'm a I'm a statistical physicist, and uh, uh, maybe this is why I have a better knowledge than. Uh, so I think uh, okay, uh, what can be done? I think uh, I think that the, 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 there should be more connection among the different projects and programs. I didn't know anything about the Anthropocene campus, so I'm happy to know. And uh, there should be collaborations, but I could mention, for instance, that uh, uh, in a couple of weeks in Trieste, we'll have a workshop whose title is uh, Quantitative Human Ecology, and we are bringing together data scientists and statistical physicists and uh, many others in, uh, to discuss uh, concepts like uh, uh, mismatch of time scales between policy measures and the relevant system dynamics, accounting the human impact and agency, integrations of different dimensions, inequality, climate, biodiversity. So, uh, and also, uh, this will start on July 5th, 25. So we are at the end of the workshop. I would like to advertise this. Uh, and also the, the, we have a project on quantitative uh, sustainability that, uh, to which I've been collaborating. We wrote a, a document and uh, trying to, to make proposals. So I think that we should connect more. So we should bring the different communities that are developing in their own niche, uh, uh, new theoretical approaches, new uh, um, computational approaches uh, that, uh, uh, of course, together with also political uh, uh, interventions and uh, societal discussion and all that, that, we should make an effort of connection of all these different communities. And I have the impression that we are still working a little bit too much in, their, or in, their, in our own niche. And there is no much of information uh, uh, on common information and, and about what has been done. And uh, I will con conclude with an issue uh, so, uh, uh, about information. Uh, about how we know that things happen and uh, uh, and how we know that. And this is a mystery for me. So I, I don't really understand how information flows in societies of humans. So uh, I there is a mystery and uh, I decided to create a group in, in uh, as uh, assisted uh, my di direction at CISA in, 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 for, in uh, communication because uh, I don't understand why the, 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 how information works. Uh, so there are hubs clearly where if you get information there and then the hub will propagate and maybe we can ask people in Facebook or in Google, uh, they, they not, must know better than us. 
but then there is also shadowing in information. So things that, so the, there are parts of our society that don't know for some reason that I don't understand. So I think that if someone uh, is able to understand how the process of information goes, there uh, the, the will be a, an advantage also for the project that we are uh, all together uh, trying, uh, to, trying to launch. Thank you. I think it's always good to end a great podium with a mystery. So we want to we take this as a comment and a challenge for the future. I want to thank you again for three great talks. And, and now, without further ado, to the concluding remarks by Bernd Scherer. And uh, I, yeah, 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 this one. Okay. And I just put here. So. Okay. Yeah, you can use the arrows. yeah I, I think I use it. Yeah. <clears throat> is, uh, is there interference? Uh, no, 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 this is off. Ah, okay. So, uh, <laughs> after so many days of uh, presentations and uh, discussions, uh, bear with me. Uh, what I think uh, should be opening uh, remarks and not closing remarks because I think uh, there are so many questions, so many themes addressed in the last days uh, that um, we, it's, it's wonder, would be wonderful to look ahead than to look back. But first of all, I would like to thank, uh, to uh, congratulate Jürgen to his uh, birthday. But I would especially like to thank uh, Jürgen for his wonderful collaboration during the last 10 years, which we just learned was the hottest years. <laughs> So it was, uh, to some extent, also a hot uh, uh, cooperation. And I learned uh, to get to know you as a person who is inspiring in his way to interact with us um, and very open-minded, uh, very um, generous also uh, the way you cooperated from a scientific institution with a cultural institution, which uh, is not taking place so often, at least not for such a long time. So thank you very much for the last 10 hot years, Jürgen. Uh, Jürgen said already that everything has been said. So bear with me when I say the same, only a little bit differently. <clears throat> in my closing remarks, I would like to combine some points which have been raised in the conference with what I consider as major insights from the Anthropocene project I just mentioned. Here I will throw on the last speakers and pinpoint some implications of the Anthropocene concept, implications which the new Institute of Geoanthropology may consider. It is a reflection on the role of humans in the Anthropocene, including what we also just learned uh, as an important point, the scientists and the role of knowledge production. Since we have to take into account the human factor in the Anthropocene, I will be short after three days of complex presentations and discussions, I offer you just seven points. My starting point uh, was already made. Basically, uh, Ricarda used uh, and, and Manfred used uh, uh, these charts, uh, which are representing the uh, great acceleration. Uh, basically, I use it as an entrance point uh, because these charts for me refer to a crisis we are in. So, I think it's important uh, when we discuss the role of the scientists and the role of knowledge production that we know and reflect 
that we are in a crisis. And a crisis, basically, in the scientists and the knowledge production, means also that we have to go to look for new concepts, uh, that the old concepts don't, are not functional anymore. And basically what uh, these graphs represent is uh, the human impact on the Earth system. Uh, and uh, you can see that from the middle of the, basically from the middle of the last century, this is an exponential growth uh, with the implication that humans not just intervene anymore here and there in nature, but are in a process of destabilizing the Earth system as an Earth system. When I said uh, we are at the point of crisis, and uh, these uh, asks for um, conceptual changes, uh, I would like to refer in my second point to one uh, major change as far as knowledge production is concerned, and uh, would like to explain them with this image. Uh, what you see here is used to be a garden to grow tomatoes. But nowadays, it's a plantation, which is basically a machine, a technological machine. Uh, it's uh, from plantations in um, southern Spain. Uh, so everything basically is provided by a te technological process. Uh, what we can learn here is that in the Anthropocene, and this is just only one example, of course, um, Nat so-called natural processes and cultural human processes are getting completely intertwined and produce new kind of phenomena, uh, which are challenging the way of knowledge production, which is divided uh, uh, classically into the uh, natural sciences on the one side, the cultural and social sciences on, on the other side. My third point so this is the question of um, changes of basic categories. The third point uh, I call the creation of new worlds. The anthropocenic development is driven by a close cooperation of the sciences with technology in capitalist economies. Scientific knowledge is more and more used not to know the world, but to construct new worlds in ever shorter time spans. New technological generations follow each other in time spans, uh, time spans of five to 10 years. We are faster in creating new worlds than in understanding them. New forms of knowledge production, my fourth point, new forms of knowledge production. The, these new realities ask for new forms of knowledge production since the development of new disciplines would take long the new disciplines would be outdated by our own world making. Here, knowledge production in the arts or in activist contexts started to play an important role. Fifth point, the role of rationality. The anthropocenic development, which led to the crisis we are in, can be looked at as a development of unintended side effects. We tried to solve the energy problem, by nuclear energy and created nuclear waste as an unintended side effect. We tried to solve the hunger problem by synthetic fertilizers and contaminated soils and waters. The unintended side effects are realities which are not taken into account by the rational solution of problems. They are the dark side of what we look at as rational development. These unintended side effects were for some time in the shadow of a linear development model, but are now more and more foregrounded ever faster. Six, the role of the scientists in this existential crisis. Scientists are not just observers in the anthropocenic world, as we learned. They are actors, observers, and affected by these processes. There is no pure outside perspective anymore. The pandemic already demonstrated that there are developments possible in which the global infrastructures and thereby the world, for example, the, the, basically the technosphere, uh, the world we constructed and used to live in imploded in a very short time span. From my perspective, 
perspective, this asks for scientists to take responsibility. I would differentiate here between the basic and the applied sciences. In the basic sciences, which I consider fundamental, the challenge is to think the world radically different, to use their freedom to develop radically different conceptual frames. How imagination is modeled in the evolutionary Earth system is an interesting question. But I'm convinced that the new uh, Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology, which Jürgen was able to found, will pursue exactly these objectives. The applied sciences, on the other side, should concentrate on practical solutions for our actual problems in a dynamic relationship with the basic sciences and not contribute to an economical model which presupposes unlimited growth. My last point, seven. Before the pandemic, I spoke with the famous German filmmaker, Alexander Kluge. In this talk, Kluge was imagining a possible collapse of the global system. That was in 2018. This possi possibility reminded him of the year 1945, after the Second World War, which is called in Germany, the Hour Zero, the whole country was in ruins. People were each day confronted with questions of survival. For Kluge, this was a situation where it became clear what are the fundamental cultural techniques, habits, and strategies in order to survive on an individual and on a collective level. Whenever Kluge in his later life was confronted with major problems, he reminded himself of this hour zero. One, not, only, not the only one challenge for our knowledge systems is also to prepare ourselves for such a situation. When we get these days reports that more than 800 million people on the planet are undernourished, we should be reminded that these people are experiencing already the collapse of their worlds. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thanks much. I, I don't have to answer questions. I think you don't have to answer questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It was there. So, uh, dear friends, I'm overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the many signs of friendship that you have shown towards me. And I'm also overwhelmed by the richness of your intellectual contributions and achievements that you have displayed uh, in this conference. And I, I only heard one complaint about this conference. It may have been too short for everybody <laughs> to give their uh, you know, contributions here. And I see many people in the room who are my friends and who I know could have made wonderful contributions as well to this. But, uh, you know, we, we have informal occasions to, uh, to, f to fill this gap. So some words of thanks are in, in order. First of all, a thanks to all of you for coming to this event, to the beautiful city of Trieste and to the welcoming environment of CISA. And of course, the support of ICTP and uh, to all of them for offering and extending to us such a wonderful hospitality uh, in these days. I want to, of course, thank particularly my friend Stefan Rofo, uh, who had the idea of organizing this conference. And I have to admit, I had the fault when he proposed this of saying, yes, this is a wonderful idea. It was immodest of my side, and I admit that but I couldn't resist Stefano also because we were friends together with an entire group of physicists in the eighties and the group uh, that comprised Marco Pettini, who is here, that uh, was a group around Angelo Baracca. And uh, what I learned in, in terms of statistical physics, I learned from you guys, from my Italian teachers here in Rome. And I'm quite aware that you're right, Stefano. At that time, and these were the eighties, 
some of these, you know, non-linearities in complex systems were well known, at least in Italy, at least in, in Rome, where I studied. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks also to Andrea Gambassi uh, for putting this uh, conference together. And I should emphasize the decisive role of the scientific committee who met during the pandemic in many Zoom meetings to discuss the program of this uh, conference. And uh, they did a fantastic job in bringing together many, many different facets of uh, my, of our intellectual life. And uh, as you could see from contributions from uh, many parts of the world, from many disciplines, from many periods of uh, history, uh, they succeeded in really making a nice program. That is, at least is my impression. Uh, and it included even, you know, important cultural events. So I'm grateful to my friend uh, Luca Lombardi for uh, organizing a wonderful concert and giving a wonderful speech as well. So many talents uh, are in, in this friend of mine. I know that. Uh, but it was wonderful to share this experience with all, all of you. And uh, also the other cultural event that we witnessed last night uh, with uh, Nucho Ordina. I have to say, talking about the scientific committee, that it is a pity that some of the members of the scientific committee who invested a lot of time in organizing this conference were actually unable uh, to come. And I want to mention in particular my friends uh, Chang Bai Chun, Tian Miao, and Don Salisbury, who I saw on the, on the Zoom participation, I'm not sure, Chang Bai Chun just eclipsed, no, he is again, uh, uh, for bringing uh, this conference coming into being and for the time they spent. Uh, of course, I also thank all the other members of the scientific committee for what they have done. So, uh, but this meeting would not have come together without the creativity, the intelligence and the energy of both the local and the non-local team that actually took care of the organization. Uh, and so this is the time for a special applause for Claudia and Mila from CISA and for Lina, Lina Schwab, who managed so many aspects of this conference from Berlin at a distance of more than 1,000 kilometers, uh, really managing by location over this enormous distance. So I pause for an applause for those who have actually. Done. Oh, there are more people involved as, as there are always uh, to make this event, uh, you know, a smooth and, and, and well working one. Uh, so on the badges you read, uh, this is a conference in honor of Jürgen Renn, but I think this needs some amendment actually. Uh, it really is a conference in honor of all of us. Uh, that is a, a, uh, in honor of a community to which you all have contributed, which you all have shaped. And maybe this is the moment to also mention some of those who can no longer be with us, but who have played an important role in shaping this community. My friend and mentor, Peter Damro, uh, Yehuda el -Kana, our young colleague, Markham Hyman, who died much too early, Wolfgang Edelstein, Thomas Settle, and, and to mention just some of them. So, you know, that the community owes much to them. They have been mentioned rightly so in this context because they have given a lot to this community. So, but what is the future of this community? So during this meeting, I have to say, I have heard so many uh, new ideas, interesting ideas, uh, exciting ideas that I'm not worried about the future of this community. And I mean, the history of science, the history of knowledge, those who study the Anthropocene. So that's what I mean by the larger community. And uh, Stephen, uh, also, you know, a long-term friend of mine has mentioned, you know, the, the average age, you know, may have been, uh, you know, a little bit higher than in, in other meetings we have held, uh, but we have also heard young ideas. And I thought some of those who were not among the youngest of us, you know, brought forward exciting research program on which we could find, found a new institute, you know, several of them actually. So I'm not worried about this. I'm a bit worried, as you know, as you all know, uh, about the institutional future of the history of science. But on the other hand, we have seen also in the last uh, section, but not only uh, in that, uh, about so many opportunities to make the epistemological acumen 
of the history of science and of the history of knowledge uh, useful in practical challenges, in urgent challenges of mankind, that I'm also not worried about the future role of, of these ideas, practices, and of, also of the people who carry them. And in particular, also of the, um, uh, the, the acumen, the, the awareness of the political, cultural, and epistemological entanglement that we always see when we deal with the history of science. And we have seen that, for instance, in, in Rivka's talk and in uh, Costa's talk about uh, uh, Galileo and his time. And it's also clear that this is exactly what we need in order to address the challenges of the Anthropocene. So uh, that certainly will, will uh, remain relevant, even if it does not necessarily fly under the flag of the history of science, but that's really uh, should, should be our least worry under which flag this, this is sailing. So once again, my heartfelt thanks to all of you who have turned over the last decade so many of your individual projects into a communal, into a joint effort. And I think you know we all owe a lot to each others and to this community which we have commonly shaped and uh, to which this conference has paid a wonderful tribute. And I would even say it has strengthened and invigorated uh, this effort. That at least is what I hope. And therefore I want to end with a practical remark. It would be really nice if you allow us the organizers in particular to share your email addresses so that we have a common list of participants. Maybe you share also some of the text so that we can read them again and the slides so that there is a record, but not just for history, mainly I would think for the future so that we can stay in contact as a community. And with this, again, I wanna thank you very, very much for you know being with us these three days. Thank you very much. Uh, a, a, um, a person that I would like uh, to, to thank is Alessandro Tavecchio, who was behind the, the, the curtains. Uh, uh, and uh, it's invaluable the work that he has done. And uh, again, the technical assistance of ICTP. Oh, oh, okay, so uh, we, we have an evening together tonight at Teatro Miela. For those who were there last night, they know with the presentation of the book of, of, on Einstein by Anoch and uh, 